Hello and welcome back to another episode of Beyond NSU. I'm your host, Chloe Ryan, and today I have the honor to be here with Janae Osterheld, a 2001 graduate of Norfolk State University. How are you doing, Janae? Great, now that I'm here with you, Editor-in-Chief. So, Janae, you graduated in 2001, and you're from? I'm from Virginia. You're from Virginia. North and South. I'm from, born and raised in Alexandria, and then I came over to the illustrious, incomparable Norfolk 757 Ocean View for uh, high school and college. Okay. So what made you choose NSU? I didn't choose NSU, NSU chose me. Um, I had a lot of life cir circumstances going on uh, surrounding my senior year of high school and mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to go to Norfolk State. I didn't require a lot of parental support, which I didn't have at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had scholarship money available to me. So I came to NSU, which ended up being a real blessing for me. Okay. Well, you had mentioned growing up in Ocean View earlier at your event. Um, can you elaborate on growing up in Ocean View, your story? Um, I moved to Ocean View when I was 14 years old. It was an unexpected move. Uh, my mom moved there kind of on a whim. We had kind of a check-to-check -check household where sometimes we would just wake up and my mom would have moved the entire family somewhere. Um, I spent most of my life in, in the DMV area outside of D.C. And um, my mom wanted to go further down south for one year, so we went to South Carolina and had what I call a rich year where she had a great job and lots of stability. And then she went through what she went through and we ended up in Ocean View. Um, Ocean View is like gentrified beyond right about now and mm -hmm. it's lots of condos and the street I lived on doesn't even seem to exist anymore. But when I lived there, it was a lot of hustlers and dreamers and make believers. And um, it was like a beautiful place in theory because it's right near the water and everybody mm -hmm. wants to be near water, water gives life. But it also felt like a place where you were so far away from the water that gives life. Um, but for better or worse, I met some of the best people of my life there and I'm thankful for that. Would you say that your experience in Ocean View impacts your writing? You're a successful columnist, an editor, you do everything, you're now a director, you're doing short films. So would you say your Ocean View experience kind of built that foundation of this is what I'm going to write about. You write about social justice issues. So would you say that you're up there? I would upbringing... say my entire experience. I, Ocean View is definitely a big part of that, but mm -hmm. I would say my entire life informs the work I do. I would say my life as a, as a black woman informs everything I do. I would say my life as a black woman who had a white mother informs everything I do. I would definitely say living in Ocean View where there was the hustlers, the dreamers, and the make-believers absolutely helped add to who I am and the way I fight and the way I move in the world. Um, Late Taylor High School absolutely let, you know, helped put some yeah. juice in the pot. Okay. Um, and Norfolk State ultimately is, uh, Alexandria made me, Norfolk raised me, and Norfolk State gave me divine purpose. I like that. And when did you start writing? I've always written. Um, I was an early reader. I started reading as young as three. I was writing sentences in like little short poems in the first and second grade. Stuff about peanut butter, it was really ridiculous. I wrote about strawberry milk in second grade. We are each other's people. I see it already. So writing was always like a, because I loved reading, writing came natural. Mm -hmm. um, I loved building worlds. I was a latchkey kid, uh, meaning I stayed at home unsupervised as starting in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, so what I had was books, pencil, paper, TV. Um, okay. So I wrote a lot of stories and made a lot of worlds. Um, I should absolutely have a book by now, but I don't because I spend all my time doing journalism. You have time. You have time. <laughs> you Thank definitely you. have time. So you described Norfolk State earlier as home, became your home. Elaborate on that for me. 
I never had an address longer than four years until I came to Norfolk State University. We were a family that moved a lot. We were a family that often lost a lot of things. So Norfolk State became my home, first and foremost, because it's the address I held the longest at that age. Um, secondly, my best friend, who I'd known since I was 14, we kind of definitely became each other's home then. And I became home in myself. Because Norfolk State is such a place, such a safe place to be black, and not just any kind of black, it's a place where blackness is freely not a monolith, mm -hmm. where there are black people who speak Spanish, there are black people who speak Tagalog, there are black people you know, from the West Indies, it's just every type of black exists on this campus freely. Um, and I think it just gave me such a sense of spiritual awakening and safety and solace. Um, blackness is a love song here and it gave me a comfort and a calling that allowed me to fully be myself, I think, for the first time in, in that ever, and that's what home is. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Now, what organizations were you involved in? I know you were involved in the Spire and Echo. Um, yep, I was student life editor at the Spire and Echo. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Joyce, Ed Bowser, and the whole team, and Dr. Kuntz. Um, I was briefly involved with the SGA, not in any kind of leadership capacity, but definitely was active. Mm -hmm. um, I founded a poetry organization with uh, Melina Lawrence, Divine Tectonics. We did poetry night every Sunday in Spartan Station. It was definitely a scene. <laughs> yeah, I've um, heard a lot about it. Yeah, it, it had a quite a leg. It outlived me for, uh, it went on for a while even after I graduated. Um, I am a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Um, DGNG for life. Um, and it's past Centennial, but we still want Centennial energy. So, <laughs> um, and uh, I was a member of what some people call the tree people, but basically we were uh, a bunch of black folks growing our hair natural, vegetarians, way before it was cool and popular. Okay. Cultivating a sense of self and black pride. Um, and that was probably like my first non-organization organization, technically okay. speaking. It sounds fun. It was. Now, how did you find a balance with divine techno techno oh. tectonics? Tectonics. How did you find a balance with that, with tree people, <laughs> with <laughs> the spired They're echo? Gonna, Kamal is going to hate Academics. me. Academics. <laughs> so how did you find this balance? And did carrying all of this weight help go into the real world? Um. I also worked at J. Crew at MacArthur Center. Oh wow! Um, so you're doing everything. Yeah. Do you? F I feel like it definitely did set me up for how to move in the in the real world. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I had a sense of harmony back then that mm -hmm. maybe I don't necessarily have now. Like yes, I was doing a lot back then, but I think there was such a harmony. Everything kind of sung together. Mm -hmm. um, and you were a kind of, you were on campus. You I was were, on campus. So it was like, okay, I just have to run to this meeting. Yeah. This Freshman meeting. year I had 18 credit, at first semester I had 18 credit hours. Oh. I did a lot. Um, I don't know, I think I had such a strong support system and a really awesome best friend and just people around me who we all kind of wanted to win together. So yeah. I think it lent itself to a sense of ease, even if there was a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I think in the real world, sometimes you got to kind of rally yourself in a way mm -hmm. to make that harmony, even if you have that same support, because out in the corporate world, things just get a little different. Yeah. And you're not going to always have be in a room like this filled with black people. You got to sometimes deal in a system that wasn't built for you, that's not meant for you. And navigating that wears a little bit on your spirit, mm -hmm. but it's necessary. And I think if I didn't have the fortitude and love that was poured into me at a HBCU, then I wouldn't be prepared to navigate those very real systemic hurdles that are in the real world. Okay. Well, speaking of systemic hurdles, what would you say was your most difficult systemic hurdle that you've dealt with as a journalist or that you've reported on as a journalist? You know, that's hard to really say. I mean, part of it is the steady diet of bad news. You know, mm -hmm. I can't opt out of hard news stories or look away or not pay attention. You know, some people can just unplug. I can't. I have to mm -hmm. bear witness to all things. Even if I'm not writing about it, I have to know about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then there's that thing that, you know, if you are a black journalist, especially a black woman journalist, I deal with an extreme amount of hate mail and I've had death threats and stalkers. And there's not a lot of protection in the world against that. Um, no. We've almost built a culture that has normalized that type of behavior and that's very hard to navigate. So you need your support system, you need therapy, you need to be able to go say, hey, I can't, boundaries, you know, I have to take yeah. a walk today or I can't do this story right now, I need to walk away. Okay, it's good to know that you take those mental health breaks, especially in today in society. Mm -hmm. You have to. So I wanna know what you did after you graduated. It's 2001. And um, you just got out of NSU. A month later, I packed up my little silver Volkswagen Beetle to the brim with all of my belongings uh, out in front of my best friend Arkita's mama's house. Mm -hmm. um, packed it up and drove across the country to Kansas City, Missouri, where I covered music and concerts and entertainment and a bunch of fun stuff for four months. Mm -hmm. um, 9-11 hit. I was actually on a plane from Disneyland the oh, night wow. before on September 10th. Woke up on September 11th to 9-11. Um, couldn't get in touch with any of my friends and family back east. Was supposed to be writing about Jay-Z's The Blueprint, so I still had to go to the record store while also writing a story on what it was like to live in the Midwest and not be able to reach my family in D.C. and Northern Virginia. So wrote about that and then also wrote about the blueprint in the same like 48, 72 hours. Uh, and then a week later drove my car to California where I interned there for four months in the Bay Area covering education, crime, and pretty much anything they told me to cover. Okay. <laughs> then I drove my little bug to Minneapolis where I worked there for four months. Mm -hmm covering music and lifestyle. And at the end of that year, Kansas City called me back and said, hey, do you wanna cover music, lifestyle, and entertainment for us? And it was that or go back to J. Crew at MacArthur Center. So okay. I packed my bags and took my talents to the Midwest. <laughs> okay. So how did you go from music, entertainment, to a beautiful social resistance? Justice. And social justice. Um, it was a natural progression. I spent the early part of my career doing uh, column writing and, and music writing, music criticism, concert reviews, fashion. And just because of the very nature of what it is to be one of the few black people in a white newsroom and be a part of a black community in an area that doesn't recognize blackness, those things are going to come out in your work naturally you're going to write about those things even when you're not writing about those things it's in the backdrop so mm -hmm. even when i was writing about music it was in it i would weave those types of themes in there writing about mm -hmm. lifestyle i remember writing about black dolls and the absence of them or hair and how people want to police it and then trayvon martin and mike brown happened and i felt immediately called to speak up and i never quit and it wasn't even me asking anyone, could I do it? It mm -hmm. just, I started dedicating my column space solely to fighting for black lives. And um, it just became more and more who I was, what I felt compelled to do, what I thought was important. Mm -hmm. And when George Floyd was murdered, you know, fast forward 10 years, after, you know, by that point I had gone off to Harvard, did a Neiman Fellowship for a year, was at the Boston Globe by this time, and. Um, the Boston Globe sent me to Minneapolis to be at that funeral. And being there was heartbreaking because, as I said, I, I had an internship there at the beginning of my career. I know what that city's supposed to look like. Yeah. So when I get off the plane and my phone is buzzing, telling me that there's, I can't get a cab, I can't get an Uber, mm -hmm. I can't do anything after seven, there's no food available, all the restaurants are closed, curfew, it, it looks like heavy militarized. Um, and it was early COVID before there was even a vaccine. So it was just, it was a wild scene. And um, being at that funeral, standing for eight minutes and 46 seconds, grieving, crying with other journalists, being at the site where he was killed, something inside me just broke. And it's not that pieces of me hadn't broken before telling our stories, mm -hmm. but the thing that broke that day broke in such a way 
that it almost felt like this spiritual water was flowing through me. And I knew that it wasn't enough to just cover our deaths, that I had to figure out how to lift us in life. And that's what a beautiful resistance is. I still write columns that tackle social justice, that tackle brutality, that tackle, you know, the fight for, for human rights, period. Yeah. But a beautiful resistance is a place to lift our joy, to lift our love, to tell the stories of our lives in nuanced ways because there needs to be a corrective for the fact that our stories are too often told through a, br a lens of brutality and suffering okay. or extreme excellence. Mm -hmm. You know, us being here is a beautiful resistance. Us having joy, us being able to go to a basketball game or laugh together. You know, Audre Lorde talks a lot about the sharing of joy yeah. and how it's so radical because it brings us closer and it lessens the threat we feel that you know, a third of our differences. So joy is this radical tool that really does build bridges. And when you look at things through a lens of love and you actually witness people, you're allowed to see their full humanity. Absolutely, that was beautiful. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. I had so many questions about pay inequality, <laughs> net neutrality being a farce and so much more. So you have to come back. Part two at Part two. Media Week. Yes. You heard MCJR, I promise. MCJR week. We will mm -hmm. do a part two. We will yes. do all the things. I need to know I your writing process. All the questions. And I, I I'll be fully prepared for you, Chloe. We'll, we'll wear matching. We'll, we'll have color. You know, we'll we'll color be like an R&B group up here. <laughs> matching hairstyles and everything. The whole we could, thing. You just let me we know. We could do braids. Do lemonade you know, braids. We could, we could do it. I'm always with some lemonade braids. All right. Norfolk State, y'all are beautiful. Thank you. Well, again, we have run out of time. Thank you all for watching, and thank you, Janae, for being here with me today. I'm your host, Chloe Ryan, and I'll see you on another episode of Beyond NSU. Be in your black joy. Mm -hmm.